Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Trader Merlin Show. It is your Friday weekend edition. We've, got, of course, got a lot to talk about because uh, you've been all sending in so many darn questions, which I love it. Keep sending those questions in. For those of you who might be new to the show, you can always send me questions in at the email I just posted down below. It's TraderMerlin at gmail.com. And, of course, if you're new, click that subscribe button in the bottom right-hand corner. That will get you updates uh, whenever we do the live shows, which is pretty much every day at 2 p.m. Pacific time. But I'll also be doing some weekend shows and potentially even special little pre-recorded pieces just for fun. Uh, hello, Les. Tom, Jeff, Big Eb, Jorge, Koja. Good to have you guys with us. And uh, it is Friday, which means I'm going to have my custom monogram glasses here at the M. Thank you for that one there. Uh, we've Today is uh, it's a whiskey day. I'm going with Grand Larceny. Someone uh, sent me an, a, um, a review that said Grand Larceny was one of the best ones out there. So I thought I would dig that out of my my buckets of whiskey out there. So cheers, everybody. Hope you had a fantastic trading day. And, uh, and you're Don Julio Nejo in 1942, Big Eb. Yummy, yummy. Mm. Okay, I'm going to be going through a lot of questions today. What I want to do is obviously we'll start with this wonderful graphic here I put together, and I think that this kind of sums up what's going on. You're going to have empty streets, a lot of places closing down. Uh, California, as of tomorrow night, we go into shelter in place, which means only takeout for restaurants. So even the, the sliver of social activity we could have is now being pulled off from underneath us, and we'll see how much of an impact that has on the markets. Clearly, not that much of an impact, right? I mean, you saw the markets out there today. It was just go, go, go. A large part of this is due to what's happening next week. As you guys will see in the Monday market, must knows put out by Online Trading Academy. There is a pretty big announcement happening next week, and that is, of course, the budget on Friday. Well, the government shutdown on Friday because December 11th is where we kicked that deadline to for the budget. If the, the budget isn't agreed upon or not reached, then then what happens? We go into a shutdown. Remember the last time we had the shutdown, it's the longest in history, it was 35 days under President Trump from December 2017 to January of 2018, that 35 day, 35 day window. It could happen again. You know, right now, I guess the big overall question is, is what is President Trump going to do? Is he gonna play friendly or is he gonna play antagonistic? And he has the power to veto that anything that comes his way. We shall see. My guess is he'll veto it just out of spite and say, oh, I was, I'm, it was, the election was a fraud. I'm just going to veto this until you guys fix that, which would just be the wrong thing to do. Let's do the right thing for America and move forward with whatever that stimulus and budget package may be. Now, that said, that's just for the budget next Friday. If that doesn't happen, I think that, well, I think if we all took a step back and said, does... Does the average American have confidence in our political leaders? At a certain point, I think many of us, I am raising my hand aggressively right now for those who might be listening to the podcast, uh, have lost faith and trust in my government. And I think at some point they need to do something to make us feel like there's a reason we elected these people. Whether you're Democrat, Republican, Independent, I don't care. I think we both agree that our, many parts of our party and administration just suck. So what is that going to do? I'm not quite sure that you will see a budget passed on the 11th, which means we'll probably go into a government shutdown. Of course, do you want to go into a government shutdown right now of all things? God, I mean, I could see the stubbornness to say let's go into a shutdown, but this is not the time to do it. So we'll probably kick the can further down the road. That still won't resolve anything. What will probably make Americans feel warm and fuzzy and forget about the fact our government and politicians are inept and just morons that get paid six-figure salaries to sit there and argue with each other is... Stimulus. Of course, I think the market is rallying aggressively this week because of the anticipation of stimulus next week. So what I'm, I'm thinking will probably happen next week is we will probably see markets continue to rally and then near the tail end of the week, if we finally get it, which I think we will, uh, the stimulus package, markets will probably sell off because it's it's priced in already. You look at these market moves, we're at all-time highs, blue sky territory. Uh, I, I think it's pricing in a good amount of uh, stimulus and right now the stimulus right at this point I believe is looking to be around 900 billion dollars so certainly much shyer than the two plus trillion we had back in February or March but uh, all in all it'll still be a pretty good chunk all right yeah I, I like that Chris let the politicians try the vaccine first and, and um, Jeff thank you for that email I you yeah, it sounds like you're in the medical world let me know what those numbers turn out to be on this one um, you know, I'm one that I like to see the test results. I've, I'm a big fan of the process that the FDA puts companies through 
phase one, phase two, phase three. These processes take years to do. Right now, I mean, Pfizer is is got to be loving it because they're being fast tracked through with almost no testing on these things on human subjects. Uh, I don't know, and no long term impacts of it. It's really scary to me to be taking something. You know, I mentioned it yesterday, kind of jokingly, where you know you take a medicine because your your sinuses are are running. Oh, I want to fix my sinus, so I'm gonna take these pills. And it's like, well, if you take this, you're you know you will you will be bleeding from your butt. Your ears will you lose hearing. Your vision may be impaired, and you could die. It's like, yeah, but you won't have a runny nose now. I don't know. I have a feeling that uh, 10 years down the road, those that take the early vaccine, you'll see something late night infomercial going, did you take the COVID vaccine back in 2020? If you did, call our legal attorneys at this number right here. Anyway, we'll move on from that. Um, let's see. I want to go to some listener qu- Actually, I'll show you what happened today because there was some economic news that was rather interesting. And it's these two numbers right here. I think I put the highlighter on it. Ba- boom. There we go. Unemployment rate. Uh, as I expected yesterday, I thought we'd actually do better on the unemployment. And we went from uh, 6.9, they were expecting 6.8. And I said, you know what? Given the uptick in the unemployment or the downtick in unemployment claims this week, I actually thought that you would see unemployment lower than expected. And that did come out, in fact, lower than expected at 6.7, which is another reason you're seeing these markets rally. Now, let's be truthful here 6.7 is still relatively high given historic norms. However, it is drifting back down towards those norms. So that's a good sign to see unemployment rate drop. The weird uh, you know, about face here is what you saw with non-farm employment change. We had 610,000 new jobs created on the previous month's non-farm employment change. They expected it to drop to 480. Well, that's a decline of 130,000 jobs. It, it came out at 245. I mean, that's almost 360,000 jobs cut. That to me is is not good. So you've got a great piece of news with the unemployment rate, but all of a sudden that non-farm employment change is far worse to me that it way offsets the unemployment rate number. So, you know, you got to kind of figure out which one you want to pick there. Fortunately for you who are along, the market shrugged off the non-farm employment change and really focused on that unemployment rate today. Uh, I think that'll come back and bite us because that's a pretty ugly number. Uh, Canada also doing very well out there. Expectations were that Canada was going to see a little bit of a bump up in unemployment. Actually went down to 8.5%. So all in all, not too bad there. Okay. Uh, let's go to some listener questions. And I, I told you guys, I'm not gonna, I am not don't want this show to turn into a cryptocurrency show, but there's been some very interesting questions. And I wanted to show you some mathematical differences. And one of the main reasons I'm so big on Bitcoin is this sheer math. There's 21 million coins. There will never be more than that. There will always be growing less than that because of coin destruction and people losing their private keys. So a great question came in from Antonio. Thank you for the question, Antonio. He says, where do you anticipate the price for Ethereum going to when Bitcoin hits 1,000? Is there anything to be said about the future price of Ethereum just like there is for Bitcoin? For example, Bitcoin has the halving, and for those who don't know, every 210,000 blocks, the reward for miners gets cut in half, um, and it reduces the amount of coins created each year. That highly impacts the price target, uh, price, price heading towards the $100,000 target. Okay, so here's the huge difference here. The reason I love the math behind Bitcoin, and I'm not putting any predictions out there for Ethereum, is simple. Ethereum's numbers are not constantly changing. They're fixed, and I can make a projection based off of fixed numbers because the variables aren't changing on me. For example, I know that there will only be 21 million, ever. I know that right now there's 18 million. I'm assuming that there's 4 million lost, meaning 4 million private keys have been lost. We'll remove those from circulation. So now I can start to build a formula. I know the emission curve, so I know how many new ones will be created, but I will always have a maximum ceiling on that 21 million. Ethereum has infinite supply. There is no ceiling on the supply of Ethereum. So I did the math earlier just to give you guys an idea. Um, Once it switched, so Ethereum 2.0, which just happened last week, switched from, I think it was four Ethereums rewarded every 12 to 15 seconds for for the binding of the blocks to now two. And we'll see how that changes in the future, but it just went from, it actually went from three to two, excuse me. What that means is you have about eight Ethereum created, new supply created every 60 seconds, every minute. If you look at um, the hourly, you're looking at 480, uh, roughly 480 created every hour. That's 11,520 created per day. That's 4.2 million created per year. 
So as long as the annual demand exceeds 4 million per year, it will move up. The key is it's gonna continually every year be producing coins and it does not have a ceiling. At some point there could be 300 million Ethereum out there. At this current moment in time, there's about, I think, 113.8 million. Even that number is kind of disputed, which is weird because if it's actually a blockchain, you should know exactly how many are out there, but different sources will tell you it's roughly 113 million. So just off of that, I've got Bitcoin maximum ever, 21 million, and I have Ethereum maximum ever, I have no clue, infinite, could keep going on forever. I have current supply known on Bitcoin, which is about 18 million, and I have current supply known on Ethereum, which is about 113 million. Big difference there, it's almost a factor of 10X on price with regards to Ethereum versus Bitcoin. The big challenge here in, in creating a forecast for what Ethereum will do for the future is what Ethereum is actually doing. Remember, Bitcoin is just a store of value, it's gold, it's that place to park your cash and get away from that fiat money system and get away from the Fed and controlled centralized entities. Ethereum, on the other hand, is very different structurally, right? You're not really looking at Ethereum as, well, this is my store of value. You're looking at Ethereum as, is this the backbone for all products, all decentralized financial applications? Are all the new companies coming into this decentralized world going to be using the Ethereum blockchain and plugging into that? If that's the case, then the value of Ethereum will get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over time, but I don't know how much because there's so many competitors in that space now trying to vie for what Ethereum is doing. I mentioned EOS, I mentioned NEO, and there's many others that are competing in that space. So, very challenging to make a forecast. Obviously, I do think that Ethereum will be going up, but because it has infinite supply, and because the prospects of competition for uh, Ethereum are so much greater than I think it is for Bitcoin, I don't really want to put a price tag on it. You know, I, I, do we see it at a thousand? Sure, no problem. I think a thousand will probably, you know, go by the wayside probably early this uh, early next year. Um, you know, do I see it at ten, twenty thousand? I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't think it will get that high. I think by then somebody will supplant them as the backbone of all these decentralized applications down the road. Anyway, that's me. Um, and, and you're right. Josh says Ethereum could be the lead dog in the end. They could. What's What's great about Ethereum is they have the the savant um, Vitalik Buterin on their side. That guy's just crazy intelligent. And of course, they now have money to recruit some top programmers and developers to help them fix what, what the major problems are. The major problems of Ethereum are scalability. You guys might recall when I was doing my, my session um, for you on the show, really talking about um, why the cryptocurrency world is so critical. There's three phases, right? You've got the store of value, you've got programmable blockchain, and then you have the scalable programmable. Ethereum could not handle all the volume on their network. So they did a couple different things. We won't get too nerdy, but they're doing things called sharding. They're also creating Ethereum 2.0, which will create different layers uh, and other pieces to help more transactions be there. You don't ever hear about Visa bogged down and, oh, I can't swipe my Visa card. It's just taking forever at the kiosk, right, to get my credit card to JCPenney's to swipe. That is a bit different than what you're seeing with Ethereum. Ethereum, it's getting slower because of more applications are coming on board trying to use what Ethereum has built. By them making Ethereum 2.0 and the adjustments and investing in their scalability, they've now taken it to the next level and it's now getting much faster. My assumption is down the road, they'll do it again and they'll have to continue working on their scalability because nobody right now in the crypto space, maybe EOS, can compete on the scale of transactions per day that a Visa does. And if any of these want to get to that level of transaction scalability, they have to benchmark themselves against Visa. All right, so there you go, Antonio. I don't have a price target for you. I, I am bullish on it, but keep your eye on their competitors. Keep your eye on EOS. Keep your eye on NEO. Even things like Tron could end up being competition here for them. I know, Tron, of all people, there's a lot of competitors out there. And right now, I think it's whoever makes those smartest decisions will win the battle. Here, let me give an example on why I think Ethereum may have sharding, S-H-A-R-D, not sharding. No, that'd be a totally different blockchain, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, here's why I think that Ethereum might have so many problems. I'll give you an analogy. You guys might remember the lead dog in 35 millimeter film, Kodak, right? Kodak came out with the first digital camera. Kodak to me is the Ethereum of today because Ethereum came out with a programmable blockchain that people could plug into and use. Unfortunately, uh, 
Kodak should go back and find out who were the executives at that moment in time and just beat them all with an ugly stick because those guys clearly dropped the ball on the importance of digital photography and how it would take over the landscape. Kodak is the laughing stock of the camera world. Nobody uses a Kodak camera and even make them. Hopefully Ethereum will be bright enough to look towards the future and say, you know what, we have the lead dog right now. We are the lead dog. We're number two or three in the world with regards to market capitalization and cryptocurrencies. We better take some of our capital now and dominate that marketplace. Even if that means doing what uh, Facebook did when they bought Instagram, saying, I know that blockchain over there is competition. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy them out, try to integrate them, or just kill it all together because that's competition for me. Hopefully they will do that and maintain that dominance. I hope that they don't go down the road of becoming a Kodak and watching the others develop better, more powerful, scalable technologies and leave them in the dust. Why? Because I own a lot of Ethereum and I hope that they do well. All right, that was the first one. And uh, if you guys have questions, let me see if I see any here. Um, uh, could an inverse correlation between XAU and... Well, the Austrian Hispanic says, could an inverse correlation between XAU USD, which is gold US dollar, and Bitcoin USD be developing? Um, you know, we talked about this the other day, and it was a question that I posed to the audience, and, and many of you agreed that I think that there is a, a change in mindset from the gold bugs. We talked about it with John O'Donnell yesterday. A lot of these gold bugs, you know, and for those who know what a gold bug is, they're the ones that say gold will always go up. Just buy it. Buy it and hold it, and you'll never go wrong holding gold. That's a gold bug. I think a lot of them, and you heard John O'Donnell's open-mindedness to it yesterday, saying, you know what, yeah, I, I, I could see getting a little bit into the Bitcoin space because it is looking like a digital gold. And, and I think what you're seeing now is not necessarily an inverse relationship, but just a flow of assets out of something like XAUUSD and into BTCUSD, which is why those charts are starting to look like uh, Rorschach drawings and kind of doing the opposite. So you know, to me, it's, it's an interesting time to see market acceptance of a, a new, intriguing new asset class, which we'll call cryptocurrencies, in this case, Bitcoin being a lead dog. Uh, it's very interesting. I don't know if that will be a historical relationship where we see them opposites. I think it's gonna happen for a while until there's a balance where people feel like Bitcoin is, is as accepted as gold and then they'll probably flow in tandem, if that makes any sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, Mark, that's another great example. I believe, what was the movie? Uh, Once They Were Kings or the, the the Land of Kings or something with Bill Gates and Steve Jobs back in the day when they were showing them as kids. Mark says, Xerox did the same thing with the graphical computer interface. Um, uh, it wasn't GPI. It was called, um, what was it called? GUI. Hey, gr GUI, graphical user interface. It was GUI. So yeah, Xerox came up with the GUI, the graphical user interface, because no one wanted to go to a DOS prompt on a computer. They, and Apple... Uh, it wasn't just Apple, it was uh, Microsoft too. I think Microsoft's the one that did, ripped it off from Xerox, if I, if I remember correctly. But either way, Xerox had it, right? Xerox had the lead dog and graphical user interface for computers and either Apple or Microsoft stole it, took it, bought it, stole it, however you want to look at it, and then built their own version. And that's the same thing I see as a potential risk here for Ethereum. Now, I don't think that Ethereum is lagging that far behind. I think they're pushing that envelope and trying and understanding all the points I'm mentioning, plus many more I probably can't even talk about. Okay. Um, all right, let's go to the next question. This is from Tom. I think Tom might actually be here with us today. Tom says, I always like to have a trailing stop on my positions. When there is a supply and demand history, it's kind of easy to pick a stop. When something is on a bull run with no supply zone, how would you determine where to place a stop order? An example would be Bitcoin. If it had a total meltdown, uh, where would you want this safety net to be? Okay, well, um, a couple things. In an up market, a stop is not the challenging piece, right? In an up market, stops are pretty easy. You put it down below your most, what you feel to be the most significant demand zone or your price point where you just say, that's as much as I'm willing to lose the targets become much more challenging because as Bitcoin breaks 20,000, you look you, you look yourself off to the left over there. Actually, it's probably backwards, right? Uh, you look off to the left and there's no level to, to shoot for. So what you end up getting is a lot of traders will use specific tools like Fibonacci extensions or projection lines to help anticipate a point in the future. Now, while that might be fine and dandy, there's no proof that price will ever turn at that point. It's just simply a speculation. So I don't, I don't really have a, an answer for you as far as how to target. Uh, you know, I would probably do something like a Fibonacci extension as well, just to 
maybe give me an idea where it might go. But as far as setting stops, that's pretty darn easy. I'll go out here and I'll look at the BTC USD futures and bring that chart up for you guys. BTC USD. Still kind of consolidating out there. We had a little bit of a down day today to about 3% on Bitcoin. Um, but you look at where your stop loss might be. This, is, this becomes extremely challenging because look how volatile Bitcoin has been. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's real difficult to say. Like for example, if we did a hard right edge, and I'll, I'll change the screen here so you guys don't see that. And it, let's say we're right here at this point. You know, and you're looking at that price chart and you're saying, man, it looks good, but I'm gonna put a low below 18,000, right? We know where it's at right now, but just bear with me. Um, you know, I, maybe I'll put my stop at 17,977, right, where that line is drawn, just below the lows of these wicks for those two days. Well, you know what happened the next day? Boom, you're out, right? You're at 18,000 and now you're left holding the bag. So it's difficult with something like this because it moves so much on a daily basis. I think the challenge when you're looking at something, I guess there's two questions here, right? Number one is where do you place your stop losses? Number two is you have to adjust your mindset for different asset classes. I look at something like Bitcoin and I, I echo Big Eb's statement here, stay long on Bitcoin, right? Just stay long on it. Why? Because of the simple math equation I presented to you guys a few times, it will mathematically, as long as something doesn't erode demand significantly, Bitcoin will continue to go up, especially now that companies like PayPal and other big institutions are allowing transactions and purchases of crypto through PayPal. Gotta love that. So, you know, there's one stop, you put a stop loss there, you put a stop loss down below these lows. I mean, these are two logical points that I'd be using for stop losses. If I was gonna have a stop loss on Bitcoin, um, other asset classes, you know, it's the same thing. You'll be looking for those demand zones. We can probably go to SPY as a good example. Now, Tilly, hopefully will get me some videos this weekend and I'll produce that video for her so you guys can see what her market analysis is. But, you know, there are some unfilled gaps here. You've got this nice unfilled gap that started back on uh, Monday, or excuse me, Friday was where we gapped up on the 30th of November, and then it, we jumped up over the weekend, right? Well, that unfilled gap will probably fill. It's at 362 on SPY. Well, the question now becomes, well, where do you put your stop loss? Is it down below that tail of that day on the 30th of November, which brings it all the way down to a low of 359? Um, or, you know, do you put your stop loss down below this most recent area of kind of sideways congestion, which was going back to November 19th through 23rd? I think it's, it's up to you on how you plan on doing that, but bottom line is demand zones are easy to use for stop losses. It's the uncharted territory that becomes challenging. Uh, GBC... Uh, BTC USD as I go back to Bitcoin here um, you know some people have asked you know how, how do you calculate using projections very challenging as well right here is let's see I don't even know if I have them I think I might have removed those tools uh, price extension lines what you usually do is you go from the big, latest biggest move which I guess we could call from down here in Bitcoin to the latest peak and then measure that retracement and now it's starting to give me some lines as to where it may be going to according to those Fibonacci percentages. And you know, now it's giving me targets up here at 19.5, it's giving me one at 21.7. You know, that's a little bit harder to, to make a forecast that it's going to get there, but at least it's something, right? So there you go. I think that's the, the quick and easy one to answer that question out there for you, Tom, is demand zones are easy to identify. You just gotta find the right one that fits your strategy best and that's below that is where you put your stop losses. Uh, the target is the most challenging piece. And and I'm on the camp as others here with Bitcoin, I would just stay in it. I would keep it. I would definitely keep it. Okay. Sorry, I had to take a nice fresh frosty taste of whiskey there. Now this is an interesting one. I think Les is in with us today. So let's go through all of these. This is an interesting one. Les says, I have a few questions about algorithm trading. Now, just so you guys know, I am not an algo trader. I do know that it has a major, major factor in our equity markets. You know, if you go back to 2010, it was only like maybe 10 or 15% of the average daily volume is estimated to be done with algorithms and HFTs. Now you're looking, uh, but what was the number? I just looked it up earlier. I think the number was something like 80% of transactions. Even if it's 50% of transactions. That is a monster amount of volume. So the question, the first question here, and there's three of them, was can algorithm programs move the markets much, especially on a quiet day, like just before the holiday? 100%, 100% they can move the markets. Now, 
years ago, uh, actually it ties into the second question here. So yes, they can absolutely move the markets. And the, the thing to remember here is that algorithms are triggered by specific actions that those algorithms are programmed for, which is interesting because they can be man manipulated, if you will. So if you're an institution, you could do something. You could take a, a big block of capital and just do a market sell or a market buy. Either way, you just do a market order, for, but you gotta do like a $10 million worth, right? It's risky. But what happens is when you have a big surge like that, all these algorithms are gonna be triggered. And what they'll do is if something starts a rally like that, they're gonna just go out there and start buying more and front running every order that comes in and it will actually push it up even further. So you can find them and get them to chase. That's why we get these flash crashes, right? Flash crash is simply algorithms chasing each other and all of a sudden it's triggering and then more triggering, more, and it just goes parabolic, straight up or straight down based off that selling. Fortunately, I think a lot of these programmers have put in some kind of circuit breaker that if it moves X amount, we'll just pull out and, and reevaluate as opposed to start chasing things. But that's what was causing a lot of these flash crashes was simply algos and high frequency trading front running orders. So the second part of this is, are they working during the after hours? I don't have any hardened proof there, but I would say yes, they are. You gotta remember the difference is this. When you say after hours, you're really focusing on one market. You're focusing on equity markets because those markets are closed. Once the equity markets close, these algorithms are going to be um, stuck using limit orders only. Market orders do not work in after hour sessions. So there would have to be some tweaking done to those algos. It's much easier to set up an algorithm to do market orders. It's just simple and easy. However, you look at Forex markets, you look at futures markets, algorithms are in there as well, and those are allowing market orders. So if you say after hours, you're specifically talking about equities, my assumption would be yes, they are there, but I haven't seen any proof personally of that, but mm, let's be honest, if there's an opportunity for these guys to make money with computer systems, they're doing it. The last piece, do they have a footprint when they trade? Sure, they all do. Everybody has a, putment, a footprint. And the only way you'll know what the footprint is is by how heavy they walk. And when I was a real high speed trader back on the floor in the late 90s, one of the things I would do would be looking for that, the Bigfoot, right? The guy who's really leaving marks. And you can see by their actions in level two, it's really difficult to, <laughs> It's really difficult to explain what exactly you're looking for, but I sat and looked at level two every single day for six and a half hours. I could see when somebody was coming in and holding up price, whether they were doing it by themselves and using their market maker name like GSCO for Goldman or MLCO for Merrill Lynch, you could see them buying. But then they realized that I'm watching them and they would stop using their names and they'd use ECNs like BATS or back in the day was Island or EdgeX or EdgeB. So, you could see if somebody, I don't know who, is accumulating a big position by watching the time and sales, the transactions, and what was going on on the bid and the ask columns of level two. I'll be honest, it's very difficult to see those things. I mean, I there were times where I was so excited when I just spot something happen like that. And like, I would tell everybody on the floor, like, hey, I got somebody just backstop in this thing right now, let's all go long. We'd all jump in, everyone would go long, and all of a sudden you'd see that price just start to rise because somebody, could be an algorithm, could be an institution saying, I'm buying everything at this price, whatever the case may be, we saw the footprint, but that's because I was literally looking at it underneath the market microscope, which is level two screen and the time in sales. So they do leave footprints, and you can see those footprints, I believe, on price charts, which is kind of what the foundation of OTA's content is, is looking at where do we see institutions buying. And when we say institution, it doesn't have to be Goldman Sachs, right? It could be, uh, you know, I got Big Eb in here, and maybe Big Eb is a, tr is a trader who has an algorithm, and he's got $50 million behind it, right? He may not be what we think is the institution, but he's trading a big amount of capital, and maybe on this one security that I'm trading, that's his ballpark and he's he's moving that market. So 100% they leave footprints. The key is looking at price charts. Looking at price charts and seeing how they move, how they react to different actions during the day um, and how price goes into those zones, how it comes out. And, and that to me is, is how you spot those footprints. All right, another sip of this fantastic John F. Fitzgerald Larceny Whiskey. Um, Larry says, never had a portfolio. How many assets would you recommend? I'm an electrician. I'm broke every Friday. <laughs> well, that's not good. If you're broke, you shouldn't be trading. Um, 
Larry, the question is, first off, what is your what's your objective, right? If it's you want to build a portfolio for your IRA or your 401k, the number of positions is up to you. The more positions that you add to it that are that are diversified, the greater you're hedging your risk, right? You're you're spreading around that risk by having multiple assets. That said, if your portfolio consists of three positions and it's uh, SPY, IWM, DIA, and QQQ as four positions, those are all equities. So that's not diversified. You're not really spreading around much risk. But instead, if I had, let's say, SPY, so I got the broad market, um, I have a little bit of IWM, so I go those volatile penny stocks or small cap stocks. Uh, maybe I go IYR, so I got some real estate in there, a little bit of GLD sprinkled in for fun, and maybe I buy some TLT. Now I have a lot of non-correlated assets that's spreading around that risk. For me, that's how you'd want to allocate your portfolio long term is breaking it up into different percentage allocations of those different instruments. Now, each instrument I mentioned, uh, I'm trying to remember the ones I mentioned, but SPY, GLD, IWM, uh, IYR, and TLT, as an example, each one of those instruments has a historical normal rate of return. When we use those terms like historical and normal, it doesn't mean that every, if I say the SPY has an, an historical rate of return of 8%, it's very rare that you're going to get 8%. You might get 4%, you might get 15%, you might get negative 20%, but over the long haul of time, that average is gonna be about 8%. That's just what time has told us. So the, the key there is to build that portfolio to fit whatever your objectives are. And don't tell me my objective is just to make as much money as I can. Eh, have a number in mind, right? I want to achieve this benchmark of capital in my account or be able to get it to this point here where I know I can pull out $1,000 a month for the next 20 years and still live off of that. That's really what we should be calculating out there. So um, Larry, I mean, you're an OTA guy. The proactive investor class is that's what it's all about is not only determining what the portfolio should look like, but identifying what our goals and objectives are and saying, how can I structure a basket that is going to reduce as much of the risk as I can, but allow me to get to those goals that I've established for myself. Okay. Um, I try to trade more than 10 million on any given day. That a boy, big M. We didn't want to call you small ad. So small ad, we got to call you big app. So 10 million, cheers to that. Okay. Um, what else do I have here? Let me go to some more listener questions here. And Otto, my friend from South Africa, it's always, I wonder, Otto, how you found out about this show in South Africa. Um, I apologize for not getting to this one sooner because obviously this example is null and void right now, but I do want to cover it because you guys know I'm candlestick fan. I do like Japanese candlesticks, and there's a lot of ways that we can utilize those to, of all things, help increase the odds of our success. That's bottom line what we're trying to do. I can't say you're going to make money. I can't say you're going to lose money, but I can say that our goal is to put the odds in our favor. So Otto says, what's your view of the bearish engulfing candle that Tesla made on yesterday's close on November 30th? This was a few days ago. I apologize. He says, would you share your trading, your rules for trading it, downside targets, or do you see it going higher? Okay. Well, I will do this. I, I love doing the thing called the hard red edge, which is you you go to that candle and, and it's good to do this with somebody else because obviously we can all see the screen right now but if you look at this pattern right here this is what's called a bearish engulfing formation it reeks of bearishness i mean it's it's a horribly bearish pattern which is great if you're looking for a trend reversal and thinking you know what i might be going short on tesla because i see all this inherent weakness coming into the market the way it works for me is very similar first off let me just tell you this i don't like this pattern I'm not a fan of bearish engulfings or bullish engulfing patterns. Why? Look at how much it's moved. I feel like you've already left so much money on the table, so much money on the table if you're reacting after this comes out because you need this pattern to form here. And I know it's difficult for those of you listening to the podcast right now, but if you if you happen to go to the price charts and oops, dab nab it, let me hide that again if I can. Come on. Ugh, there you go. If you go back to your charts and you look at the candle that formed on November 7th, uh, November 27th, which is a small kind of almost a, a shooting star formation, which is very bearish, and then you look at the engulfing pattern that formed the next day on the 30th of November, you have to let both those candles form, meaning you're not making a trade until the, the next day. Well, I guess we have to put parameters. And if I was to trade it, it would be very similar to how I trade the shooting stars of Harami, right? I'm gonna go to the low price here. I'm gonna make that on snap mode. And I would say that, you know, if on Tesla, it opened up somewhere above 554.50, 50, 
and then came back down below it, then I'd be okay shorting it. But boy, that's a that's already a big move. The next day, it didn't do it. It actually formed another Harami formation. So, you know, this I don't know. I'm not a fan of the bullish engulfing or bearish engulfing. I do like the Haramis. I just think that there's too much um, too much money given back. Also, as Big Eb says here, I don't trade Tesla directly. It's too wacky. Agreed. Not only is this thing the, the darling stock of the markets right now, you have to understand it is now going to be added to the S&P 500, which is like the, the golden ticket in Willy Wonka. I mean, it, the, the being added to the S&P 500, it's like the market saying, you can do no wrong. It's like when President Trump was saying he could walk down in the streets of Times Square, shoot somebody in the head, and nobody would give him a hard time about it. Tesla can do no wrong right now. It can just keep going up because it's going to get added to the S&P 500. Now, of course, we know Elon Musk and his wackiness, and who knows if he's going to go smoke another joint on Joe Rogan's show, or he's actually going to toe the line and not do anything crazy. At a moment's notice, he can create havoc for Tesla. So I'm with Big Eb. I'm not trading it. I shy away from it. There's times where I've, I have traded in the past, uh, normally buying puts on it when it gets really overvalued, but I'm, I'm not a fan of it. Uh, even if I saw this engulfing pattern, though, on other securities auto, I'm not that attracted to it. You know, when I look at my scans and filters, it's not even on there. You guys have seen my watch list here. Let me see if I, I had it up still. Yeah, there's the watch list. Um, I just have a few different scans and filters in the watch list, and none of them are those ones. I have hammers, Bollinger Bands, shooting stars, and bullish and bearish Haramis. That's all I'm looking for. Not that that's what you have to look for yourselves. It's just saying that there's. that's what I found the opportunities and markets to work best for me. Do indexes add Tesla and tranche as well? I'm not exactly sure how they're going to go about it. I do know that the S&P 500, since it is a an ETF, it's a fund, they would have to go out and buy enough shares appropriately to make the weighting that it is in the S&P 500. So they're literally going to have to go to the open market and buy shares of Tesla. But that's not the important part um, if, if the SPY does it or the, the index of the S&P 500. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of mutual funds, Fidelity, Newberger, Berman, you know, BlackRock, they all have a, a large cap equity index tracking fund, which all it is is the S&P 500. So every one of these mutual funds that tracks the S&P is actively going out there. My assumption would be they're doing it now and building a position in Tesla to swap this out. They're probably doing it off book and then when the day comes, they'll plop it in because if they do it at the wrong time, their index could look significantly different than the S&P 500. I know it seems strange, but they're probably building that position that they need to create the appropriate balance for the replacement. And then as soon as it happens, they'll take whatever assets going to be kicked out of the S&P 500, swap those out, and then go to the open market and start selling those other shares. They're probably shorting them right now anyway. So, But that's probably how it would happen is the... Uh, because I believe these funds, they need to have the same mirror. If they don't have the same allocations as SPY or S&P 500, their index is going to look slightly different. And they don't want that. The whole point is they're tracking these indexes. So that's what happened. Okay. Uh, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Let me check. Ooh, somebody, somebody doesn't like chatting. You guys always email me. Uh, Terry says, can you go over that list of shooting stars and hammers? Okay. Um, all right, Terry. Why not? Since we're here. I've done this for you guys before, but we'll just do it now. So as you saw, one of the fields I'm looking for is this hammers. And there's only four on my watch list right now. You've got HRL, gotta love Hormel Foods. And you guys see that uh, hammer formation? It's not really that good to me. It's not good because it's, it's in the middle of sideways action for the better part of a week. Now, if this candle that I'm holding my cursor on right now or circling was over here right after this big red one, then I like it. Then I'd like it. So that one, no big deal there. Not really worried about it. Um, this one's not bad. It's it's not a great hammer. You just notice it's closing kind of almost just about halfway of the body of the distance of this candle. So I don't really like ALXN either. Kimberly Morgan, or Kimberly Clark, excuse me. Eh, none of these look like trading opportunities for me. If any of them, Walmart probably looks like the best buy. And again, if you want to know the rules for trading it, it's simple. I put a line across the top here. If it breaks above 149.51 after opening below 149.51, then I'm considering I'd be interested in buying it. Okay. Whew. I got a lot of stuff going on here today. 
Let's see. Next question. If you guys have questions, feel free to type in. I just had a bunch of pre-recorded or pre-sent in questions I want to make sure I get to. So next one is from Emil, and this one's kind of very subjective. This is, I guess, was a comment that was left in the video I did about making your own trading computer. Emil says, after I have this computer ready and having no knowledge about trading, where do I begin after watching your Candlestick video? And this is a Candlestick video, by the way, that Online Trading Academy produced, or I produced for Online Trading Academy, which I thought was pretty damn good, by the way. But it's funny, some guy, there's so many trolls out there. I don't know if you guys have seen the Candlestick video I made for Online Trading Academy, but you can go check it out on their YouTube page. Um, this guy in the comment section, he replies, this is the worst video ever. You know nothing about Candle 6. Um, it's like, this is total garbage. I feel like you're a scam. And I'm like, really? I've got like 300,000 views on that thing. Oh, very, very, very few people give it a thumbs down. And you're the only negative comment. I'm like, could you please tell me what was wrong about it and why you thought I was a scam? Anyway. So, Emil. If you have no knowledge of the markets, your first expense needs to be not a trading computer. It needs to be educating yourself. It needs to be going out there and understanding how these markets work, especially for the asset class that you want to trade, whether it's stocks, futures, forex, options, commodities, real estate, crypto. It's all the different asset classes out there. Now, where do you go to do that? There's certainly a lot of great information, and I would plug this show, of course, and say that there's some good information you can get on this program. However, I, I think that for the most people, if you're just starting out, a lot of the stuff that I cover here or the discussions that we have with the audience are going to probably be a little bit above your head. Um, I thought about putting out a basic you know, a basic uh, trading class on the web, but it's just too much for me to do. I have other things I need to spend my time on. There is a lot of free stuff you can find out there. The, the thing I will tell you is this, Emil. You want to invest, you want to pay for education, right? There's a lot of people on the web, some of which have no business even talking about financial markets because they probably don't even trade. And I've seen so much garbage information out there. It's about finding the right information and who's going to fit your personality style. Uh, I, for one, would say go to Online Trading Academy because that's who I teach for and I build content for them and I believe in what they do. Um, but there's a lot of others. You've seen a lot of guests on this program. You know, you, you guys saw uh, Ryan Watkins or Sam Evans or Corey Lane. I mean, these guys have their own teaching schools. Um, Gabe Velasquez as well. But in many of those, it, you'll go in there and it's going to be very advanced. You know, from if you want to learn from the ground up, Online Trading Academy would be the way to go. It's just from the very foundation of discipline, money, risk management, and then building from up there and building a strategy on top of that. But really, it's all about um, spend some money and learn. Don't be like these little Robin Hood kids who think they're geniuses up 40% in the year and they get in a bad trade and lose everything. It is, um, Chris says, pay now or pay later. I think I think you, you pay now because if you don't have an education, the cost is much higher than actually going and paying for an education. It's a cost of doing business. And if you don't learn the right way of how to approach markets, the market will charge you no matter what. Even for people like myself who've taken lots of classes, I still have paid a lot of money to the markets doing dumb shit, stupid stuff I shouldn't have done. And I'm sure all of the people watching right now would absolutely agree with that they've done the same thing. But it's about finding mentors or finding a system or strategy, most importantly, learning about risk management so that you don't do the dumb stuff. This used to be like a, an after school special where there's this pot, uh, a cooking pot on the stove of boiling water, right? And he's like, I just wait for some kid to come by and grab my handle. <laughs> and somebody with a mitten on grabs it and turns the handle in so nobody grabs the handle. We all know that the pot of hot water is going to burn you, but some people want to go and test it anyway. Well, the easiest way to test it is to put your hand over it gently until you feel it start to burn. The bad way, which most new traders test it, is they grab it with both hands and pour the boiling water in their face and, like, okay, well, they're done. So it's about getting an education and learning from people who've, who've burned themselves to the pot of water before. Um, sadly, I have done it many, many times. Um, you know, and again, here's uh, Austrian. He says, I blew three accounts before I started making a reasonable return. Right, and Austrian, I don't know your, your teaching background or any classes you may have taken, but you probably could have prevented a lot of those accounts being, or those three accounts being blown if you had a specific set of rules and didn't violate those rules. I mean, the only way that you guys blow accounts and I can say it too because I've blown accounts, is you're trading way too big a share size, you violate your stop losses, you're just in things you should not be in, and you're not following rules, period. Well, that, to me, that's what education is all about, is having somebody beat that into you until you finally get it. Okay, I'm not going to violate stop losses. I'm not going to trade too big. I'm not going to uh, trade the most volatile stock of the day. It's, oh, Tesla's up 50% today? Great, I'll put all my money into that one. 
boom, it's gone the next day. No biotechs, pharmaceutical stocks. You know, it's these things that we do to help us stay out of bad situations. And as anybody in this group will tell you, the key to trading long term and being a successful trader for the rest of your life, it's not about making money. It's only about losing it. And if you lose a lot, well, you're done. If you lose a lot of littles, that's okay. As long as in the long term, your gains overshadow those small losses. All right, um, what else do I have? Uh, that was that for that. Let me see here real quick. I'll bring up a, bring up a chart since C H G G, huh? C H G G. Never even heard this company, uh, Austrian. Never heard it before. C H G G. Technically, doesn't look bad. There's only one thing I don't like about it, and that's the volume. I mean, its average is two million, so I guess that would slide. But I'm not a big fan of really thinly—not I wouldn't say really thinly, but low volume stocks like that. Um, you know, right now you're in a, an interesting spot. You, you, he writes for the viewers at home. Uh, he says CHGG appears to be basing around seventy-six dollar handle, but it's under the Ichimoku cloud. May I ask for your thoughts? Of course, you can ask me for my thoughts. Now, I don't really look at Ichimoku, but you are looking at something that. If you wanted to, and again, this is, goes back to the old adage that if you torture a chart long enough, it'll tell you whatever you want to hear. You actually have a small bullish flag formation, right? You have this really fast accelerated move, move 15% up in six days. Now you have this slow kind of retracement, and we could draw this in many different ways. I'm just, I'm just arbitrarily drawing these lines. I don't think I'm, you're supposed to catch the wicks. But if you look at this channel right here, you have really a bullish flag formation. That's actually a rather positive sign. Uh, I actually like the way it traded today because it didn't make a new low. It just, well, intraday it did, but it didn't close at a new low. It's just kind of staying there. So I like, I actually like this one. Um, you really, you're going to want to wait and see what that breakout is. So your, your next action for me anyway would be, I'd look at this high that we achieved for today's price, which is going to be a high of 76.97. And if we get a break above that, I think you've got a decent long on your hands here. You do have a huge unfilled gap that goes all the way back up to 86 bucks. So chug, chug could be chugging along here, but you know, follow this pattern. If it continues to drift down in this pattern, for me, if it if it stays another day or two or three days in this channel, that flag is broken and I'd have to reevaluate it. But it feels like it's basing. I agree with you on that. It looks like it's just kind of not making a new low, just kind of staying right around the $75 mark. So all in all, yeah, I, I actually I actually like this one. It looks it looks fairly decent for the upside, but again, you have to you have to have to wait for confirmation for this thing. Right? I wouldn't say buy it right now. I mean, if you do, you're buying it because of this area of demand at 7530. If it breaks below that, you got to dump it. You got to get out. Cool. Cool. Well, thanks for sending that one in. Let's see. Uh, Kevin, that's a great comment. It says it's almost like going to college for trading. It could take you years. And you know, this is this is the part that I find exceptionally frustrating, especially you know being in the center of an online trading academy, is a lot of people come in and they understand that. They know you're learning something and take a long time to master and really get down. It's, it's not like you're gonna take one class and all of a sudden be making tens of thousands of dollars a day. It's probably not gonna happen, right? It's gonna, there's a learning curve. And even though you can go through a class with, I mean, tons of different instructors. Let's say you go with Larry Jacobson or Todd Davis or myself and um, you know Russ Allen, who's risk manager extraordinaire. You go in there, we can tell you all these things not to do, but boy, the nature of the beast is you get out and you're out of class and you're like, you know what? He told me not to do that stuff, but yeah, I'm going to do it anyway just because I think I might be better than my instructor. And it's not a pissing contest. I mean, don't don't try to – nobody's trying to be better than you – uh, in the halls of trading, right? I'm not trying to be better than anybody in this room. I could care less about being better than you. I just need to be as good as I can be. Some of you might make way more money than me. Fantastic, congratulations, cheers, I'll drink to your success. It's the people in this room or out there in the trading world who are getting their asses handed to them for doing dumb stuff that I know I can help out and I can save. So let's let's learn and get better in the process. Yeah, Jorge, that's that's a tough one from OTA. I, I agree with you there. There's always more and more information and stuff coming out to help you. And he says OTA gives them so much material, I can't keep up with them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, well, hey, there's a lot of information out there. Part of it is filtering through and finding out exactly what you need. Okay, um, I just realized the clock's at, at 49 after. It is Friday, folks, so I hope you all have something lined up. If you are out here in California, you know that as of Saturday, businesses are no longer allowed to have indoor dining. Well, that's already in place, but even outside dining, they're not allowed to have it. So I hope that everybody goes out and has a fantastic, I'm gonna go and just be a glutton this evening and eat so much food. 
I wonder if they'll like let you walk around with alcohol in the streets like Vegas now in California just because you can't go into a bar. Anyway, let me go to your economic calendar and earnings calendar information. Um, and I'll show you that. Let's see. Go back to that. All right. So here is what we have cooking for Monday. There really is nothing on the earnings front for Monday that's, that's noteworthy. So I didn't really bring up anything here on the earnings calendar. I did think that there obviously is some stuff happening that's important to other parts of the world. You know, we haven't focused so much on Forex for a while, so I'll try to get David. Um, <laughs> I'll try to get David Warner back on the show because he's one of my favorite Forex guys. He actually has a signature series, and next year I'm gonna or next week I'm actually be doing a series of interviews for Online Trading Academy. So if you're Online Trading Academy graduates, uh, I'm gonna be interviewing these guys for their signature series. I'll be interviewing Sean Reed, Bashir Chaya, Bill Addis and David Warner, which should be a, a lot of fun. But you can see here for the Japanese yen, if you are trading the yen, you have a pretty big announcement happening at 3.50 p.m. on Monday, and that's gonna be their GDP number. Now, right now, it's expected to stay the same. I don't see really anything dramatic with expectations here, but you have quite a few announcements for the yen uh, starting right around 3.30 p.m. Pacific time, and that's gonna be average cash earnings, household spending, bank lending, current account, GDP numbers, as well as economy watcher sentiment. So. That's probably the most important piece. U.S. just has consumer credit, which of course is expected to rise. No surprise there going into the holiday season. So hopefully, um, you know, that, that won't be too much of a driver, but it will be mainly about the Japanese yen. All right. Stitch earnings on Monday here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mark, it's funny because I have friends. Well, it's tough because I went to visit my friend in Boston and she lives uh, in, in West End or um, the North End, which is great Italian restaurants up and down the street, right? Beautiful, nice, great Italian restaurants, but they can't have indoor dining. Okay, great. See, California, we're lucky because, you know, at night, it's if you get to 50 degrees, it's like you're shivering out there. It's like, oh, no, no. In Boston, you're talking lows in the, in the, in the high 20s, maybe low 30s. Good luck. You're not putting a heat lamp above me and expecting me to eat some carbonara. Where'd the steam go? You know, you're calling the waitress. Could you pour some uh, some hot water in my cocktail here because it's it's frozen? I mean, no way. So, yeah, it's it's bizarre. Different spots of the world are going to be reacting very differently. Um, hopefully, good Lord willing, this will all pass. And um, this the vaccine does come out and it doesn't have lasting side effects where I grow a third arm or something or, you know, another second head. Uh, Orange County Sheriff Mayo Rural Governor asked him, "Ooh, that would you talk about talk about throwing punches? Um, I don't know. You you go against the governor, and then oh, now you're starting riffs. And I know a lot of people have already are already boycotting the um, the shutdown announcement that's supposed to be made. Th that said, just to make Big F happy, I've got eight minutes left here. Do you guys have anything specific you want me to dive into? Is there uh, a symbol? I know you guys are all talking a lot about cryptos. Is there something you want me to go over for the next eight minutes? Just because I'm in that f good mood here." I may as well give you that hour that Big Eb always is dying for on this program. You're torturing me. You know when I started this show, it was supposed to be 30 minutes. I told myself no episode longer than 30 minutes. I got to be done in 30 minutes. I haven't done a show under like 40 minutes since we started. I agree, Big Eb. And I don't think it's just California. I think a lot of people, um, one, one restaurant in particular uh, my friend was talking about in Boston, they're basically, you know, the cops told him, you, you can't have people in here. You got to get out of here, guys. Screw you. This is my business. I have mouths to feed, all right? I have to keep business open, and I agree. I think that it should be the discretion of the consumer. If I don't want, if I'm a paranoid about this, if I have a pre-existing condition, if I may be old and, and, and worried about it, you know what? I'll stay home. I'm not going anywhere. I'll door dash and I'll sanitize all the plates that come in and everything, but if uh, you know I'm younger and I'm okay, I think I should have the ability to go out and, and do what I choose. I wear a mask every time I go out, guys, just to be safe. Um, all right, let me go. Well, I'm going to Redondo, Ron. Ron says the cops in Redondo Beach aren't arresting anybody. All right, I'm going there. All right, two people. We got Alibaba. Yes, Tom, you mentioned that one. Tom sent a nice email. And Tom, thank you. I, I love all the emails you send me. I apologize if I don't respond to every one of them. He says, look at Zoom in light of GoPro. And, and I've never really done that analysis, but you have a, a similar situation with Zoom. Zoom is a one-trick pony, right? They do one thing, and, and they did it well. The mistake I think that Zoom is making right now is they're not – they're not expanding their product line instantly. Like right, with all this capital that these execs have, the only way to save that company, in my opinion, is to go uh, horizontal integration and just start going all across the board in different companies. The best example of that is MySpace. MySpace is Facebook. It's the exact same thing as Facebook, guys. MySpace is Facebook. It's all, the look and feel was the same thing. But Facebook came in, 
did their IPO. They were a little bit better with regards to some of their search functionality and how they organize the information, but it's the same basic structure. When they made all their money, they instantly went out and bought other companies that were up and coming in that space. So Instagram, I, I have so many friends like, well, Facebook sucks, I'm going to Instagram. They own Instagram, it's the same company. So the ability for a company that's a one trick pony, like a GoPro, like a um, uh, Zoom, that's the way you stay alive because there's no doubt that Microsoft and Google and all these other companies are stepping up trying to eat the lunch of Zoom because everyone is working from home. I still am a fan of shorting Zoom. I think that long term you'll probably do great with a the short there. If they want to survive, they're going to have to go and buy other companies to help that bottom line income because that Zoom what made them famous is going to disappear. Now, I don't have any charts really there to uh, to validate it, but you know, GoPro again kind of was the first to market but there's there's a ton of different ones i actually went to costco oh, a couple weeks ago and they had the gopro series 8 i don't know it was what two three hundred bucks but they had another one it looked exactly the same 100 percent the same looked exactly the same same casing frame everything and it was for 29 bucks and you know knowing me i almost well, i almost bought it just to just to try it out and see how it worked but um you know, there are is a i'm sure a history to it a history of one-trick ponies and how they die. Facebook, in my opinion, was a one-trick pony, but they did a masterful job of buying up you know, 30, 40 different companies out there to prevent them going away if that one business failed. And uh, Zoom, to me, is, has that problem right now. Um, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned that GoPro was going into data storage, right? storing the videos online. I, I don't know about that, but that certainly could be attractive to them. But think about this. GoPro hasn't done anything to make a camera and now they're doing cloud storage. Can anybody out here name a company that is already doing a lot with cloud storage, already has a lot of cameras out there that could very easily, probably by the end of the year, manufacture a small little waterproof device that opens up and you put in uh, an Apple smartwatch, you drop it in there and it's now a GoPro. Apple could knock GoPro out of the, I don't know why Apple hasn't done it, like called it the, the iPro, so it's just this little camera, you know, your, your watch literally slides in a case I, I, with a camera in it, I don't know, uh, to me that would be knocking them out, but uh, I haven't taken the time, Tom, to go back through and look at the comparison between somebody like Zoom and GoPro's history, maybe down the road, but uh, that'd be quite a bit of work. Um, let me see, there were a couple other companies you guys wanted, and let me keep it on the clock. Three minutes. All right, Alibaba is one, huh? Well, their earnings are out and they're done. Um, so here's a full screen of Alibaba. I'll take a peek at that one. Um, you're right in the, right now. You're in no man's land. You're you're in a period of time where it's making lower highs and higher lows. And I could draw lines across this, but I think you guys could get the general idea. Let me turn the snap off here so I can uh, fudge these lines. You know, you look through here and boy. Right there is where I'd put it, and across the lows, you know, you're looking somewhere through here. You have this symmetrical triangle forming. I don't know; it's not the best looking thing, but you know, right now it's a no touch. Leave it alone. There's nothing, nothing of interest here for Alibaba. Now, to me, it's more about looking for a break above this most recent high, which would be right around 280, and of course, a break right around this low. So, you know, if you're in this situation right now. To me, this is where you look to options and start doing spread trades and doing a spread between 250 and 280. It seems like a logical thing going forward. They already reported earnings, so you don't have to worry about that when goosing your, your stock up or down. So at this point, I don't like buying or selling Alibaba, but I'd be okay doing spreads on it. LCA for Enoch. I love the name, Enoch. LCA. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't like chasing things like this. I mean, this, whatever, uh, Lancadia Holdings 2, because apparently number one, this is the sequel to Lancadia Holdings, apparently. Uh, I'll zoom out here. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Enoch, it looks great if you're holding it. I wouldn't touch this one. Look at the volatility in this thing. I mean, really, it's been around since July when it was trading at, you know, 10 bucks, and then it jumped to 18, back to 11, up to 18, back to 11, and now it's at 23. Um, you know, if you got a strong stomach, this one's fine, but what are you going to do? Do you plan on buying it here? I sure as hell wouldn't touch it. Let me go to monthly and see what the history of it looks like. <laughs> look at look at the monthly chart of that bad boy. Um, you know, if you're in it, you're making money, great. You, you better damn well put a, a trailing stop on this bad boy because they had a 20% gain today, but this isn't one that I would touch simply because I'm not 
I'm not out there to hit the home runs. I'm not out there to get lucky. I'm out there to get high probability and things that I, I'm pretty sure are going to work in my favor. So LCA would not make it on my list. If you are in this, move your stop loss up just to lock in some profit because as you saw over the past few months, I mean, this thing has wild, wild swings. And man, I don't even know what they do, but it's not important what they do. It's the price chart I'm looking at, and that's dangerous right now. So there you go, Enoch. Um... Merlin, are you using Apple? Uh, iPhone? I use. Um, I have an iPhone, unfortunately. I hate them. <laughs> I don't. I don't like it. I don't like the iPhone because I just don't like Apple. But um, you yeah, know, there you go. Um, you know, surprisingly, Mark, I actually have a. It's a Logitech webcam that I use for this show. Uh, I actually bought a, a nice Canon uh, camera or a Sony camera, a mirrorless camera that I was going to use for a second display over here off to the side. But I just. I've got so much going on. I just haven't gotten to that point where I set up that second camera. So. Hopefully, hopefully, some point soon. Because I wanted it on off the side over here. I've got a, a wall. I was going to put a whiteboard. Therefore, when you guys ask specific questions, I could actually go over there and draw out. Because sometimes it's hard for me to draw on the screens. But anyway, okay, there you go. Woo! We got the one-hour time frame. All you guys can thank Big Ab for that one. He keeps spurring me on, trying to get me to go longer shows. Great. Pretty soon, I'll just I'll just do an eight-hour trading day. We'll, we'll just trade live while the monitors going over here, and not going to happen. Don't worry about it. All right, guys, uh, that's going to do it for me. I hope you have a fantastic, safe weekend out there. Enjoy the lockdown. Uh, I'm sure many of you probably don't have the same restrictions that we do out here in California, but if you do, have a nice a frosty beverage. Hope you guys stay safe out there. Happy trading, everybody. I will see you all on Monday, so take care, everybody.